Joining us today on Superheroes of Science, we are pleased to welcome Anne Morningstar. Anne is the co-owner, co-founder, lead beekeeper, and brand manager of Bear Creek Organic Farm. And Anne is also a professor of art and design at North Central Michigan College. So welcome, Anne. Hi, I'm great. it's great to be here. I'm very excited. Thank you for having me. So that is so many hats and it's, I, I'm just I'm trying so hard to resist saying, you know, hey, so what's the buzz there at the farm? And uh, but I can't help the bad pun. I'm sorry. That's okay. And um, to be honest, on the farm, we have call names, call signs, because we use walkie talkies so that we don't have to walk everywhere. And um, from day one, my call sign on the walkie talkie is Queen Bee. So... <laughs> I'm very, um, I'm very like in the know, orchestrating things, um, and to work with honeybees on a daily basis is basically working with you know tens of thousands of type A females every day. And so, if that kind of gives you any indication, um, I don't view it as multiple hats. I view it as just what needs to get done. And so here I am. <laughs> I like that. Awesome. But now. It seems to me, and this is like a personal uh, observation. I have no research to back up my claim that I'm going to say, but it seems to me as I, in the summers, I'm mowing my yard, I don't see as many honeybees as I used to. You see, I mean, I, I, I push mow, and so I'm always looking at what's in front of me, and uh, it just seems like there's hardly any bees these days. That is something that we are sort of combating in the beekeeping community. I am more in the sort of hobby. I've kind of found beekeeping over the course of, you know, being on the farm and um, Brian took some classes uh, when he was an undergrad. And so I've kind of learned offhand. We've gone to some conferences. We've, we've hosted beekeeping club meetings um, here in our Petoskey area, Northern Michigan area. Um, and, you know, Bees disappearing is something that I think has gotten a lot of attention because of the honeybees. But where the reality is, is native bees are actually the ones that do a lot of the pollination that you see with flowers and fruits and vegetables and things. Honeybees are certainly used. Um, they were brought over from Europe. And so they were brought, it was part of the Apis mellifera um, genetics. And so th those came over very early on, um, on the ships uh, and they kind of grown from there. And so they have brought over the European honeybee because they were such a good honey producer. And so from that, you get pollination, you get honey. And um, bees are actually the only insect that humans consume a product of theirs in terms of food. And so honey is something that we actually consume. And then honeybees and ants and humans are the only species on the planet that will actively put away more food than what they need in order to survive for a longer period of time. And so we kind of share this sort of, um, this sort of like being on our planet in a way. And so we're very connected to them. So for them to just kind of be disappearing and what's happening with that, it is a little bit like we're losing a piece of ourselves. And so I think that it's really important to be aware of, you know, what's going on. So there's a lot of different factors that kind of feed into that. Um, and one of them, not just for honeybees, but for all pollinators, that includes butterflies, moths, um, bats, things like that. Um, part of that are pesticides that are used. Part of that is taking away habitat, so native species of plants that exist. Um, and so big time agriculture, and you know, I'm from Indiana originally, and I'm from the Purdue area originally. And so uh, I certainly am familiar with large scale agriculture. And um, you know, those just are food deserts when it comes to what pollinators would be eating. And so where they would be finding food at that point is they'd be traveling further in order to find and locate these plants that they can either gain protein, which would be the pollen, or they can gain their carbohydrates, which would be the nectar that they're getting from different plant species. Um, that can happen in wood and forested areas. It can happen along riverbeds. Um, it can happen in people's yards, but that sort of also then joins in with this idea that, you know, just getting a regular plant from Home Depot or Lowe's or Menards uh, or Walmart or somewhere, a lot of times those plants have neonicotoids in them. And neonicotoids actually affect when they go back to the hive and the more consumption there is, it actually affects the psychology of the bee and of the being. And so then all of a sudden the bees are no longer able to navigate where they're going. 
they bring that pesticide back to the hive. It then works its way through generations of these bugs being born because there's multiple generations of bees, at least as far as honeybees are concerned, born, you know, every couple of weeks or so. And so it, you know, you, you end up having these hives that are malnutrition, um, they're being damaged by these neonicotinoids and other pesticides that are coming back. Uh, and so what you have is just this very um, vulnerable state that they become more prone to diseases. They have pests that can kind of infiltrate their hives more easily and they can't defend themselves because psychology, they're, psychologically, they're not there anymore. So what's happening, right? Do you, first of all, okay, do you have hives right now and it's and right now I know we're talking to you and it's winter and so yeah. what happens to those hives in the winter um, I guess maybe we'll start with that so uh, we have about 10 hives one I thought maybe wasn't alive at the end of fall but I kind of just prepared it anyway just in case um, but I actually just went up the other day and checked and nine of the ten the nine that I thought were alive are alive the other one I'm thinking never was alive so we have so far 100% survival. Um, and so what's going on now is, you know, a hive is a stack of boxes. And in those boxes, you have frames, 10 frames per box. And so depending on how tall it is, that's about how big the hive is. Um, and so what they do during winter is they actually join together a lot like penguins in this big unit, ball, cluster, and they put the queen in the middle and then that cluster kind of moves around the hive and they vibrate their wings in order to generate heat. And so they'll keep themselves at a nice toasty 40 to 50 degrees is like ideal. 40 to 45 probably would be even better. Um, and so they'll do that. And then, you know, the colder it is, the harder they have to work to stay warm. Um, the warmer it is, the more they can kind of separate and then go out to go to the bathroom. So they hold their bathroom during the winter until it's warm enough. The sun coming out, even though it's a Oh, it's still a winter day and we have lots of snow, they can still come out and fly around. Sometimes they'll actually fall into the snow and slowly, you know, pass because they can't handle the cold for that long. Um, but they're basically just doing that all winter and they move around the hive and that's why they eat, that's why they make honey is so that they can eat the honey, which is the carbohydrate that gives them the energy to make that heat throughout the winter. Um, and so they put away honey to eat it through the winter, survive the winter, and then starting in, you know, end of February, beginning of March is when the queen will start laying the eggs that will become the upcoming season's initial bees to get the hive rolling. And so we wrap our hives in what we call a bee cozy. Um, that's actually the brand. Uh, and so it looks like a giant sleeping bag. They're black. Um, and so it's this giant sleeping bag that kind of wraps around the hive. We have to ventilate and insulate at the same time. And so that's what's really difficult because it's not the cold that will kill the bees. Although, yes, they are vulnerable, like I said, with the snow. Um, but inside the hive, it's actually moisture because they can't whip off the moisture. They can't get rid of it fast enough before it freezes. And we've had hives before where there's so much moisture that you open it up. And it's actually kind of beautiful, speaking as an artist, <laughs> because it's basically just this ice crystal castle full of just bees. And so it's this cluster that's just, you know, kind of. Um, what, what do you call that? You're um, just engulfed in these yes. crystals. They're really beautiful. So uh, we need to sort of allow them to um, have, we put a piece of blue board, we put sugar on the very top with some newsprint so that they can eat through it. It almost serves as a salt lick. So when they make their way to the top of the hive over the course of the winter, they have something to eat in spring. Um, it's a fast carbohydrate and we use cane sugar, not beet sugar, because that's a little less aggressive to their system. Um, and then that blue board kind of insulates that heat that they produce that rises. And so then when something freezes or moisture comes in, the sugar is actually absorbing it. So you get that really hard, hard, hard um, candy, essentially. That they can eat. Oh my gosh. Right now they're kind of just hanging out in a cluster eating. That's all they're doing. I'm just thinking of all the different, like, science, well, okay, for me, all the different chemistry things that are happening. I'm just yeah. thinking, oh my gosh, there's a ton of stuff. So much, <laughs> so much, yeah. And um, they, they basically get to the point in, uh, you know, March, depending on where you're living, right, because there's honeybees all over the nation, all over the world. Um, and so here in the tundra, where we live up in the north, 
you know, we just had a snowstorm and we got about three feet of snow in one storm. So um, that's actually a great insulator because it actually like pushes up against the hives and then it kind of keeps them warm. And it's interesting because as the season progresses, we get closer to, closer to spring. Um, we go up there and the snow kind of starts to melt away from the hive because they are a heat index there and it just kind of separates the snow. And then we look and you can see wherever there's been one of the openings, like the lead opening in front of the hive, there's just this very, you know, concave piece of snow where they clearly come out and then you can see where they've all come out to go to the bathroom. They have this like sheltered bathroom, almost like a porta potty, if you will. <laughs> Um, because of the snow where they can come out and have that protection. Um, <clears throat> but then as the season progresses, they go up higher. And so then they come out and you see the bathroom in front of the hive on the left side. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just interesting. And then for the queen to be starting to lay her regular season eggs right now, the fall she lays her winter bees. Winter bees, they're all female, can last um, five months or sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on where you're at. So where you are and the season you have is kind of indicative of how the queen decides what to lay when and where. And so then building up, you know, they start coming out in the spring and because they're type A females, they come back in and they're like, winter's coming. We've got to start putting away honey. And so they are already prepping their minds around the fact that like, forget about that honey from last year. We need more honey. Like they have that same sort of fight or flight. And so right now, they're scouring for pollen. That's all they want to find right now. As soon as the maple buds start, as soon as the willow buds start, there's some other key plants, dandelions. Those are the plants that they're going to be looking for for those big bursts of initial pollen to get that protein into the queens and into themselves so that they can start building up their strength and laying strong eggs to be able to then build up for the nectar flow, which will come about halfway through summer. And so, Stephen, when you're saying, you know, where are the bees? I push mow, where are they? Well, a lot of times they're just kind of hibernating, kind of like penguins do. They rotate, oh, and I meant to say that too, they rotate in and out who's on the outside, who's on the inside. And then they'll pass honey through. So each little cell, they'll pass honey through and they'll make sure that everybody else eats before they eat. So it's a very, the family mindset there is very much like, protect the family. It's all about the family and all about the community, community first, and then myself. So it's a beautiful wow. sort of, and so that's kind of what they're doing now is getting ready for that initial flight out into the, okay, pollen, here we come. And then they'll bring it back on their, um, they call them their pollen baskets, their hind legs, those big legs that you see, if you've ever seen those big, you know, honey, I shrunk the kids, you see like pollen on those back, <laughs> back legs. Um, bumblebees have them too. It's called a pollen basket so that it's actually kind of sticky. So the pollen just sticks to that. Um, and they'll bring it back to the hive, the other bees, the, the sort of, um, guard bees slash housekeeping bees. They all have different roles that they play depending on their life cycle and they'll pull them off, put them into cells, and then they'll heat it up and add some wax and add some other ingredients. So a little bit of nectar here and there, um, moisture to make a, a pollen bread like a bee bread. And then that's what they feed to the larvae. That's what they feed to each other to get that protein. Those bursts of protein. Yeah. So what's the, how long, you, all right, let's talk about the cycle itself, the life cycle, the different ones. Cause you said that the queen decides yeah. what, what she's like, what egg she's laying. Mm -hmm. And so she can choose to lay unfertilized eggs, which all become drones. And so every hive at the peak of the season, they'll have anywhere from 60 to 80,000 honeybees. Um, a couple hundred, 100 to 300 maybe, depending on the size of the hive, will be drones. Those are the males. Everyone else is female and those are the worker bees. And so the queen decides, you know, come fall, they don't take men or drones into the winter because they would eat too much. And so they have to reserve themselves. And so the queen will stop laying male eggs. She'll start laying the winter eggs. And then that'll be what gets her through the winter. Those bees then are the first to die when they come out um, in the winter because they're just older and they've served their purpose. And now the new hatchlings are a lot of drones because there's gonna be new queens emerging in the spring and they need to mate. 
And so then that kind of builds up the next colony and the next colony. Um, and so then with, as far as the worker bees, that workforce starts to be built up and she'll decide, okay, the nectar flow is going to be starting. We're going to need more pollen. I'm going to start laying more female eggs so that we can start to bring in the nutrients. And so they can still be eating what's in the hive. They aren't out of food. Um, but she can certainly sort of strategize with the timing so that they can get as much of their family genetics out there as possible, the drones. And then you have as much nutrients coming in as possible, the workers. And so there's a time frame with each of those. Um, and so uh, drones typically live for about eight weeks. Um, and the the worker bees, they're all sterile, but they do have ovaries, so they can start laying, but that's a very special circumstance, but they don't lay um, initially. And so they can live up for like up to six weeks, but they're the ones who are doing all the flights and, and you know, doing their thing to go get the food and bring it back. So they hatch after about, you know, 24 days or so, um, worker bees, and when they come out and emerge, their first job is to sort of become a nurse bee. And so their job is to take care of the other eggs, larvae, all the different stages until they're capped. They have wax glands on their belly, on their abdomen, that they'll kind of rub off and flake off. And when an egg is ready to be, or the larvae rather, is ready to be fully capped so that it can finish cooking, so to speak, um, that's when they'll rub their wax glands and um, kind of cover that so that it can finish growing and they'll leave it with some food and some royal jelly and some other things in there so that it can continue to eat and grow. And then when it emerges, it becomes the nurse bee. So when the next round hatches, the nurse bee that just hatched that helped bring those up now becomes a housekeeping bee. And housekeeping bees are in charge of cleaning. They're in charge of kind of helping to orchestrate things. The queen gives off pheromones that kind of tells them, here's what your job is, here's what you need to do. And so they're kind of going around the hive, they're taking out the dead bees. They're, they're taking care of any of the garbage that's in there, the wax cappings, when you uncap something. When there's hatchlings, you get a lot of wax cappings because they hatch out and you have to discard that. They drop them down through the hive. And so it's like, however many boxes you see in a stack, It'll just, you know, drop down to the bottom. There's a little tray down there. And, um, and then the, the housekeeping bees will kind of sweep it out, it out of the front entrance. And so then after they've sort of served that job, they then become a guard bee. Um, also part of the housekeeping bees, very important, is that they have kind of like the recipes, that they know how to make the bee bread, they know how to turn the nectar into pollen. Um, and I know I'm kind of jumping all over, but the, the nectar is actually a process where, you know, the, the um, foraging bees will come back and they'll bring all of what they've foraged. And so the guard bees and then the housekeeping bees will kind of take that and then put it into the cells. They then vibrate their wings and create an airflow, an air circuit through the hive, which can also serve as an air conditioner when it gets really hot. So you'll see bearding on the front of a hive. Whenever you see bees out front and they're just kind of hanging there together, um, it's actually their way of sending that air current through the hive to get them all cooled off on the really hot days. Um, and then when they're cooled off, they go back in. Uh, and so that airflow that they create actually evaporates off water from each of those cells to about 15 to 17% water content. And that's when they know it's ready to be honey. And so then they'll take the same wax glands, they'll coat it, and then it's, it's capped honey ready to be eaten. But if we were to take just the nectar, it would go rancid really fast because there's a lot of water there. And so you would get this fermentation process that happens that doesn't allow you to eat it really. Um, and so then when we eat honey, that's been perfectly cured. So it's almost like we love eating fresh tomatoes in the summer. Bees love to eat fresh nectar. It's like glorious, right? But then we want to be able to savor those tomatoes when we know it's going to be winter. And so when bees are coming out in the spring, they're just like, we need to get honey because winter's coming. So get it going, get it. You know, and so it's just like this, like type A female, just like, I got my job, I got to do my job, <laughs> you know, and so they're like helping the hive the whole way through. And then um, once they start, you know, capping the, the nectar, you know, into honey, um, that's kind of getting all these recipes going. And so you have on one frame, you have this kind of like rainbow look and it, the darker the comb, 
in the darker the cells, the more generations of honeybees that have sort of been birthed out of that. And so you're left with the residue of the minerals and things and the elements of them growing. Um, and then to just the outside of that is the pollen. And then in the upper corners of a frame, you have the, the nectar and the honey. So what I like to say when I'm taking people through a hive is you have like your bedroom and then you have your kitchen and then you have your pantry. Like you have like this really nice flow around the frame where you can kind of keep it organized. And so the queen will travel around the hive. She'll be sending out these pheromones on a continuous basis. And she'll say, we need more pollen. We need more this. So then when those housekeeping bees kind of graduate up to a guard bee, the guard bees are really learning how to leave the hive for the first time. So they do orientation flights. They come out in front of their hive. They, they kind of buzz around, move around a little bit. As an animator, I'm always like, ooh, you're like, yeah, like let's get some music going, you know? Like, um, and so then like they're kind of hovering there, um, getting a sense of like, what colors do I see? Where is the sun? How am I orienting? Here's how I enter and exit the hive. And then when they become a foraging bee, which is how they'll spend the rest of their life until their wings give out. Um, their wings, it's, it's, I just think it's so beautiful. They literally go until they can't go anymore. The number of times I've found honeybees around our farm and they're just kind of there trying to flap their wings and like I hold them all the time. So I'm always like picking them up and like kind of just brushing their heads because they're so tired. And I'm like, oh, like I want to help you do better. And so I'm just like petting them and I'm talking to them. Um, and their wings are so tattered. They just look like ripped <laughs> lace and it's just, but it's like they've had such, I mean, they've, they feel so amazing because they have just given their family all of this food and they've helped their family grow and they've they've like given it so for six weeks they're going hard and no regrets you know um one hive can travel up to forty thousand miles um in their like in its lifetime or well in its season i should say not lifetime um and then you know um a honeybee, if they're thirsty or hungry, will travel up to five miles to get what they need, and then they'll try to bring it back. That's not optimal because that spends a lot of their precious energy. And so again, Stephen, when you're talking about where are the bees, this all kind of keeps going back because they're not going to set up their house if traveling all the way to your house means that they have to travel five miles or more. I mean, six miles is like top, like they've done studies out in the desert and they've, they've done like, how do they navigate? How far can we push the food? And so they eventually find the food, they'll bring it back and then they'll keep seeing bees. Eventually like there's this mega highway where you just see bees. If you're ever standing where our hives are, you just see this bee highway. You just see them flying everywhere. They're coming and going and bringing back stuff. And it's just amazing. But if you move a food source, they can't find it because they go to the spot where it is. So it could just be two feet to the side and they'll be lost. They'll be like, I don't know where it is. I don't know. I don't know. And then they'll start freaking out. Like, where's our food? And so it's interesting just the way that they are so like no room for, you know, lollygagging, so to speak. So how, okay. I have two questions. So how like one hive, how much like space does, does it take to feed one hive? Oh. And then, um, oh, and then you, I think earlier when we were talking, you kind of had some pointers on like at the beginning of spring when they're really looking for pollen. So I guess those two questions. Okay. So for one hive, the rule of thumb is that they have an acre worth of flowering something. Okay. Ideally, it would be a, di a diverse set of something. Um, so that that way they can, you know, have a lot of different things to eat um, and not just be like a monocrop because that, if you think about if your family were to just eat carrots every day, I mean, that's great, but you'd be missing out on some other nutrients. Right. And so that's where it's like a variety is best. Native plants are best. So an acre's worth. Now an acre in terms of wooded areas could be multiple throughout the whole canopy. So you kind of get, it's not just it's, it's a flat acre, you know, um, but if it's an acre going up, cause you only have a small set of woods that also works. So that's the rule of thumb. Um, in terms of what you can be doing is bird baths are great. Um, bird baths are a great way for bees to kind of come over. They can be sitting on whatever that rock is and they can kind of crawl to it. They need something so that they don't have to fly down and land in the water. Cause that would kill them, you know, like the moisture. Yeah. So they have to be able to like, 
even just like a, a sprinkler that's like sweating or some kind of hose that has sweat on it. A lot of times we'll see them on our irrigation, which is all underground and it's all um, black uh, irrigation. Um, why am I blanking on the name? Uh, yeah, just... not, <laughs> irrigation strand. Um, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's irrigation. Um, but it's basically just, you know, water going through these underground black strips. And um, there's Wait, like- Are there tiles? Strips of water. No, it's like really long, um, almost like, it is like a hose, but it's okay. not, I mean, it's like, drip, oh, drip tape. There we go. It's drip tape. <sighs> um, black drip tape that kind of goes down all the rows. But that dripping out, a lot of times, like, especially in our hoop houses where we have tomatoes, we have- um, tarp down and we have like weed mat down and so any water that puddles up there is perfect for them so bird baths or even if you have like a like a random puddle on your patio just leave it because pollinators of all kinds are coming to drink from that you don't even know um even if you don't see them there they are and so um making sure also in the spring especially you know dandelions are a big thing. Like I know that everybody's like, oh, they're ugly. I don't want dandelions. But the deal is that sometimes that's the first and only food source, depending on where you're living. Those are sometimes the only thing that they have to choose from. And so if you mow those before you really let them feed off of it, you're eliminating yet another food source in an otherwise deserted area, like in a city or in, in some suburbs. And so letting weeds grow a little bit before you mow them down like or cut them down like let them flower for a little bit before they go to seed because obviously you don't want that spread but and don't spray that's the other thing is don't spray them because that is neonicotoids going back to the hive and it's going to just damage them and they're going to disappear faster and a lot of this also i'll tie it back together too with native bees native bees really require a lot of the same things Honeybees are just sort of the poster child because they're something that humans can connect with because we are very connected to them. I, do you, I, have if so you, I have another question about this. So um, I, I love honey and I know um, when I, sometimes I'll see honey and it's marketed as organic honey. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about yeah. like, like what's honey and, and what is organic honey and how is it different? Yep. So um, there are a lot of different things out there in this regard. It is impossible to have organic honey unless it's coming from an island where there are no pesticides. Um, and not just that, I shouldn't say it like that not just no pesticides, but like no like agriculture spray type things. Cause that coming back to the hive, it, you just, it's like saying that water's organic. You can't because <laughs> it's not really possible. Um, and so, I mean, the Brazil or the Amazon would be another option because in the deep, deep Amazon where you're like miles away, like miles and miles away, then sure. But even out here, we have 76 acres. You could be like, oh, well, like honeybees could travel beyond, but probably they don't. We're an organic farm. We don't use sprays, but we have neighbors. And if our neighbors choose to get a hanging basket from Home Depot, and if our bee, if one bee happens to go land on it and bring it back to the hive, you're immediately no longer organic. And so that's where it's, you can't really have organic honey. Like really you can't. Um, there's also a big thing between raw versus, you know, like liquid honey. Oh, yeah. Um, and so a big thing is, you know, raw honey is actually truly from the hive. It's never been heated um, past 90 degrees. And some people, depending on who you're talking to, might be like, oh, 110 is okay. Well, it's somewhere in that range, okay? So somewhere between 90 and 110, you lose all of those beneficial enzymes, minerals, nutrients that the honey has naturally in it. Honey is a natural antiseptic, antihistamine antiseptic. And so it's really great to use on like open wounds, burns, things like that, because it can really help to eliminate some of the um, damage that's been done to the skin. It can help to sort of 
keep the, um, oddly enough, keep the inflammation down a little bit. Um, and so we, a lot of times, like our son got stung by a wasp, but it was a wasp, not a honeybee. There's also a lot of misconceptions <laughs> there. Um, and he got stung and it was his first thing ever. And so we did some baking soda and cause that's what my mom taught me. Um, and then we, you know, put a little bit of honey on it in a band aid, and, you know, let him have a spoonful of honey because it helps with the inflammation. Um, and so it, and so he, you know, felt better, but there was no mark a couple hours later, nothing. And so you like, couldn't even tell. And, um, so honey is this really powerful, natural way to sort of help. It's obviously not like a full medicine, but even like coating the throat when you're sick, it's a very nice coating and it kind of has those beneficial enzymes and things that can really help you. Um, so that's raw honey. Most honey that you see large scale wise has been cut with corn syrup. And you can tell those when you turn a bottle upside down, if you see the bubble just go straight up the center, it's corn syrup. It's not real honey, um, or it's at least not 100% real honey. Um, real honey is gonna, the bubble is gonna travel up the side of the jar. And so you're gonna be able to kind of tell where that, where that is. The other thing is um, sometimes different apiaries might be like, oh, well, ours is crystallized and it's like crunchy crystals. That has been heated to the point where the sugar, it's been turned into sugar and it's no longer got these other properties. And so now all of a sudden you have um, basically rock candy because it's just sugar. And if that's all you want it for, that's fine. Raw sugar or raw sugar, raw honey, um, it's going to crystallize over time because it's, that's the natural state that it wants to be in, but it's going to be more of like a smooth butter. You can also get like a whipped honey as well that you can do with raw honey. Um, and that whipped nature that it has, um, kind of leaves it with like a fluffier kind of crystallized buttery spread of sorts. Now, all right. So, so I'm looking at the honeys that I have on my uh, shelf. All right. So I, I got a, a couple different kinds here and uh, it just happened to be there. It, one says raw and unfiltered. Okay. Unfiltered is referring to it um, not going through like a strainer. So you could get like feed parts or you could get wax cappings. Probably not. I'm sure they take out the bees, but um, we don't always take it out of our, like, what we sell to the public yet, but we always take the bottom of the barrel for ourselves. And I'm like, no, like you want to get some of that protein from the bee. Like if there's a wing in there, put it on top of the toast. Like, you know? like, <laughs> the yeah. other doesn't say it. It just says squeezable honey. So that one would be corn syrup. If, oh. Probably not a hundred percent just corn syrup, but like you are, there is, it's going to be cut. They call it cut with corn syrup. And that's to make it go further and, you know, that can kind of get into like, obviously having like, you know, pollinator contracts and why are there bees traveling on big semis and when they tip over, I feel worse for the bees. I mean, obviously, hopefully the people are safe, but it makes me very sad. I'm assuming people are safe in that scenario. The bees, I'm just like, oh my gosh, it's so sad because they're just, they're dead. You can't, like, they're buzzing around. They're not dead immediately but they're dead yeah. oh, wow. now my neighbor got a beehive of last year and uh, he told me that the bees can actually recognize him oh, is that legit through scent mm -hmm. and like even in being pregnant they very much were like calmer around me than our worker who works with me in the bees because she loves entomology and bees and plants and so she's like I want to learn so I'm taking her in and um and this is actually a good I know we're getting close on time but I um actually have a, a video that I wanted to share um and you can kind of see them all buzzing around um if you follow us on Instagram Facebook or even TikTok uh you'll see some of these videos and I'll turn down the audio just so you don't see that. Um, share my screen here. Um, and so this is, you know, me filming. And this was three days before I went into labor with my daughter this last summer. <laughs> and so, um, let's play this and kind of walk you through. So this is where we have our bees. We're just doing a, a inspection, making splits, 
And so, you know, you have this hive tool, which is my favorite tool on the farm. And so you can pull out that frame and she's kind of checking for eggs, making sure that the hive, it's an inspection. So we're making sure that they're healthy, looking for the queen, um, trying to, you know, reorganize them, make some splits, Splitting is a natural process that all hives want to go through. It basically is the queen determining when they swarm. That's really just a queen's way of saying, and those are all babies right there. So that really opaque um, quality of that capping there, it, those are all babies in there that are ready to hatch at any point in time. Um, and so then, you know, you got your, got your full hive. And so we, uh, Work with the bees, and then let me just pull up this other. So I'm trying not to hyperventilate when you showed that picture because it's like a person was like, oh, so many bees on them, and you're pulling out these things. Yep. You're pulling out these, uh, what the do you frame. call them? The, the frames. Frame. Yeah. You're pulling them out, and they have bees all over them. And wouldn't, um, why are they not attacking? Why are they like well, taking that person down? Yeah. So um, that's a really great question. And ultimately they are, they are, they come out and they're like, whoa, whoa, what's happening. But there's a couple of things that are going on and the reason why they aren't just immediately like attacking and all stinging at the same time. Number one, they're not, they will do everything in their power not to sting because the minute that they sting, they're dead. So honeybees are essentially the only stinging insect that can't sting multiple times. Um, when they sting you once, there's a barb in there on their stinger and it pulls out their whole insides. Like, so they just then slowly kind of like pass away. So at the point at which a honeybee, a honeybee is stinging you, it is because they are like, this is the last, this is the last ditch effort to save my family. It's basically, if somebody were to come to your house, pull off your roof, stick their giant hand down and start moving around your furniture and poking around in your cabinets and in your fridge, you're like, get away from my food. You're going to stab them with that butcher knife, right? Like, and you're going to try to like really do some damage. And so they're going to do everything. They're going to bounce off of you. They're going to buzz. They're going to do like a little, mm, like kind of angry jitter thing. Um, and then if you're not listening to them, then they'll start to sting you. So our gloves definitely have tons of barbs in them, depending on the time of year. And so this time of year is actually... You know, it wasn't quite the nectar flow, so they aren't super aggressive. They're just kind of like, what's going on? Oh my gosh. Like they're, they're just like, whoa. And the minute you take apart the hive, the queen's pheromones can't be in proximity. So they don't understand, they're lost. So they're like, what am I supposed to be doing right now? Now, the second you start smelling banana, it smells like banana bread, like fermenting banana. That is the pheromone that's the attack pheromone. And at that point, they would all start coming at you. So one sting sends off that pheromone. And at that point, all the bees will go to that spot and they'll just start stinging, stinging, stinging. And that's because they're like, we're under attack. They think we're a bear. They think we're a skunk. They think that we're there to like take down their hive. Obviously, we can't be like, we're helping you because when the queen decides to swarm, she's like, I want a new house and I think I want it to be over here. And so she just flies out and all the bees go with her, except the nurse bees, the eggs and the larvae, because they don't know how to leave the hive and they haven't hatched yet. So those bees are going to be the next generation of that hive. And ideally, that's when worker bees will choose one egg to be the queen bee, the new queen. They'll choose multiple and they will feed that egg ex exclusively royal jelly, which if you've heard of that, it's been like a big beauty fad and it's so sad because it's like, no, don't take the royal jelly because it comes from a sack in the back of their head that they excrete and give to um, the cells. And so queens actually hatch in about 16 days. Um, and when they come out, they're a virgin queen. And so they'll wait till all the other queens hatch and they'll start chirping and it sounds like a cricket. Um, and they're like, come on, let's battle. Who's going to be the queen? And then they'll fight to the death or mm. until somebody leaves. And then the queen that su survives and sticks around after the old queen swarmed with the rest of the hive, she'll then go out on a mating flight and then come back. And now she's ready to start building up the hive again. And so there's this natural process. So what you saw in that video was me and our worker separating them out so that the queen didn't feel like she was losing space. 
And so what that does is it alleviates her desire because it's not their first choice. She's just saying, I'm out of space. There's nowhere for me to lay eggs. I'm laying 2000 eggs a day, people, I need space. Um, and so she's very like, I'm in labor, like, let me, you know, and so, um, and so she needs that space. Um, and so that's what, that's what they do. And uh, I have some, <laughs> and you can see how all of the worker bees are surrounding her, giving her like spa treatment, like I said, and they're just like cleaning her off and, and pampering her the whole way through. And so um, she can really stick down into these cells and she'll lay a single egg in each cell. And um, she hates the light. And so anytime we're going through the hives, it's kind of hard to find her. And she's so fast. She crawls around and sometimes she flies out and I'm like, no, <laughs> like, come back. but she knows where her house is, but it's just like this feeling of like, if she leaves for too long and she doesn't come back, that's when the worker bees are like, well, there's no queen. We're going to die. So let's just turn on our ovaries and start laying eggs. And worker bees can only lay male eggs. And the reason they lay male eggs is because they think, well, we are dead, but we want our family genetics to go out into the world. So our best effort that we can give is to make sure that males are born and hopefully our family will live on. So that's their mindset of, you know. So when the queen goes out for her mating dance or whatever, uh, it's, it's with other males that are just flying around? So the um, males hang out at what's called a drone congregation area. It's typically about 20 meters off the ground. They're actually being studied a lot right now because not a lot is really known about them. Um, other than it's basically the equivalent of like guys hanging out at a bar and just wait for a queen to fly by. And then they'll be like, oh, hey, here we go. And so then they'll mate with her. And um, she'll mate with anywhere from, you know, 20, 30, sometimes 50 different males. She'll collect all their sperm and hold it there and then in her body. And then she has it in a storage. She can then call on it to be like, okay, I'm ready to lay a fertilized egg or I'm ready to lay an egg that's unfertilized. So she can hold on to that for the rest of her days. So oh. she can live for years in some cases. Um, whereas the, the drones and the worker bees live for just a handful of weeks over time. And so the queen, um, after, you know, she, if a male is successful, their penis will explode and they'll sort of turn inside out and they'll die. If they're not <laughs> successful, they'll come back to the hive and wait for the next drone congregation time. And then they'll go hang out the next time. And if they're not successful, come back and then they just eat. Males don't have stingers. They are kind of the biggest one other than the queen and they're just kind of like giant eyes they're kind of ugly um and they literally just eat the whole time and mate and then at the end of the season um all the worker bees will start kicking them out of the hive they actually drag them out of the front of the hive like i've watched it happen it's so crazy because they're like you're gonna eat too much get out like we need we need to reserve all of our food um, and so then that's when the queen, you know, she starts, she stops laying the male eggs and she'll start laying males again in March or so up here. So that's kind of how those dynamics work. Um, here is what the cell, what the cells with an egg look like. So these eggs are actually, you know, on end essentially. So that's how you know it's really fresh. Um, so any that are starting to lean over and curl up, those become an older larvae. So that's about three days. So in order for a hive to choose a new queen, which they could do if they don't like their current queen, if their current queen isn't hygienic enough, or if she doesn't do a good job communicating, or if she's hurt, um, they'll be like, yo, we need to like get a new queen stat. So like they all of a sudden will start like feeding without the queen knowing royal jelly to a cell, any cell they want, they all have to vote but any cell they want. And then you get this queen cell and then that virgin will hatch and she'll fight the old queen and 90% of the time the old queen dies or leaves and then the new queen takes over. And so these are, um, they look like little grains of rice on end. Now the honeycomb, they make that, right? So yes, um, that is another thing. This is very fresh comb. It's very pale in color. Whereas, you know, you see, um, this is, this is not current, but this is a couple years ago. You know, we have these boxes. Um, 
Okay, so here you have this older comb. This is all honey, looks different than the capped brood, which is the babies. This is the honey, it's a little more translucent. And you can see here the nectar, it's kind of shiny. So they are currently working on sort of getting all that water out. They're also filling up these cells. Um, so the age of the comb is determined by the number of hatchings that's come out. So this paler comb is brand new. It takes about 12 times the amount of energy to make one pound of wax than it does one pound of honey. So wax is actually more the golden, like that's, that is the more um, very difficult for them to produce sort of a deal. It's a lot more energy intensive. Um, and just to give you a sort of an idea, one honeybee is lucky if they contribute one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey to the overall pot of honey in the hive. So that is, um, you know, a lot of work that they have to do you know, one honeybee traveling for hundreds of miles, thousands of miles um, over the course of a season, you know, and when we have honey that drifts out, they're like, no, put it back, who put it here? So they're, they're slurping it all up to then go put it back into the cells to clean it up. That's part of the cleanup crew right here. Uh. So this is what our hives kind of look like. The different colors just stand for how old the equipment is. So that's kind of a internal... Um, me being a honeybee. Well, here you go. I'm very orderly. Uh, and so, you know, it's just kind of, this is older, older comb here. More babies have hatched out of there. But yeah. Huh. Well, that's pretty cool. That's, yeah. This is it really is. neat. I mean, that is fascinating. Fun, but, I mean, I like barely even scratched it. I'm just, I feel like I was just going 100 miles an hour trying to... <laughs> your brains but well yeah. in a short amount of time there's only so much that we can cover so it's yeah. you did an excellent job explaining basically an overview of bees and honeybees mm -hmm. yeah but, i'm so know. impressed with the the family orientedness of the i love how you explain that that's just it makes me feel good <laughs> it does. they are they are happy you know if honeybee were a character that's kind of how i always think about it they would be a lexus rose from schitt's creek um, they, they're very like spicy, um, and they're very happy and bubbly and like ready to go. And they actually have the experience of like joy and looking forward to something and like that, that excitement. Um, so they actually experience that emotion. Um, so I think of them as like Alexis Rose or, um, you know, there's other characters too, but that's the first one. <laughs> first one that comes to my mind. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I know I have tons of other questions. I was trying to limit how many I asked because you're giving us so much good information. Yeah. But uh, I wish we had more time that I could ask my others. Because uh, I know I want to know more about the bumblebees and why they collect it. And they're not doing honey. And then what is a native bee? But we'll have to probably do that on another time. And uh, we appreciate your time for this one. I say it's, uh, this is really cool. <laughs> the best thing you can do. Make sure you have some kind of water source out there, just a little puddle, that's all it needs to be. Um, and also dandelions, let them grow for even just one week, just one more week, just give, give those pollinators one more chance. Butterflies, moths, everybody, not just honeybees. Love it. I like that. I, I think most people could do that if they're willing to. Yeah, and the next time you see a bee, you know the happy ones, the ones that are the fluffy, fuzzy, um, brownish, Golden tones, those are the happy ones, bumblebees included. They're very happy. They aren't looking to attack you. The metallic looking ones, the aggressive yellows and blacks, those guys are bad. Yeah, got it. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good to know too. <laughs> They're the well, ones that give honeybees a bad name. Honeybees aren't trying to sting you, I can guarantee you that. So, well, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> So I don't, I don't think I know anyone's been stung by honeybee, but mercy, I've had the hornets take me over a few times. Yeah. <laughs> they try to invade the hive and the honeybees are like, nope. And so they'll actually eat bumblebees, they eat hornets, they eat, yeah. Wow. except the exoskeleton, it's like, yeah. <laughs> if, they there, if they come in there, they're like, nope, you're not, not getting away. <laughs> so. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So well, the, next cool. time you, the next time you have honey, make sure you know your beekeeper. 
and make sure that you say thank you to the honeybees because they're working their butts off.